It was late August when I left with my few strange possessions, some treasured photographs and music sheets, a pet bird, and a pink umbrella that I had fitted to the boat for a sunshade. I was sad and anxious as I rode out from that gentle shore, thinking of a different kind of a day, the day I had met the boys. The little fellow with the long hair, who at first glance looked like a girl, brought back the boyhood feeling of being kept inside a cocoon of clothes. The older boy was neat and trim, with a grown-up sense of purpose, a business head, saving for some wonderful object of a fascinating, rich-textured world. And then one day, incredibly, there was actually enough. into the window to make sure it was still there, into that serene world that had all the magic of a stage. And there it was, made of polished wood, curves, and crystallized dreams. A treasure you could perhaps own and touch and take home. Real life is full of disappointments and blunt, breathtaking refusals. It was unbelievable. Someone could just shake his head and upset months of planning, spoil a dream, and block the vital processes of life. You had to try to make desperate offerings like a hawk's foot or some rare collector's item, like a rich, solid blue marble. And most valuable of all, a collection of picture cards still smelling of the chocolate bars and the breakfast cereals they came in. A man couldn't blame him for picking out the best violin in the shop, one that would cost more jars full of coins than he had ever dreamt of. Yet there was a violin that the boy might be able to afford if the pawnbroker bent backward a bit. But when we were children, there was nothing more depressing than a sensible, realistic compromise. The substitute had everything but the magic of the particular thing you wanted. He could hardly bear to think of the other violin, the real one he couldn't have. This one became the enemy, an instrument he couldn't even play. There is a discouraging gulf between the sweet inner music of the mind and the slow growl of reality. under different circumstances, if I had not been surrounded by music and musical people, I would have done the same. I don't know how I looked to the boys that winter. 
flapping around the snowy landscape like a raven, dressed in my black cloak and hat from another age, another world. I remember how adults looked to me when I was their age. Rather strange creatures, conglomerations of odd clothes and actions with shoes that sometimes squeaked, and interesting things in their pockets like gold watches and money. They had something of the same fascination to a child as an old attic. softly around me, memories came to me. Memories of the many studios, the hard work, the concerts, and isolated insignificant events coming out of the theater on a spring afternoon that was warm in the sunshine. The sudden hush of an audience, the after-theater talk, and the dining rooms, and perfume, and cigar smoke, and the bright world of music. And then the changing values, things going wrong, and the wandering to foreign lands. A long, long journey, perhaps predestined just to give back a boy his love for the violin. since I felt the touch of a child's hand on my arm, that just to talk to them and look into their faces, I not only would have given back their violin, but just about everything I owned. It was a triumphant meeting of the spirits. Children have the quality of seeing right through the oddities and quirks, the wrinkles and unwieldy gait, the mask given to us by time. They can see us as the children we once were ourselves. It was the first time my cottage had been alive since I'd known it. And when the older boy asked me to play again, I knew I had a serious student.
I told the boy something of the violin and its unique place among instruments. I showed him that the violin was not simply a manufactured object, but a classical form, developed slowly over centuries by people who loved music. They were first made 400 years ago in the small town of Cremona in northern Italy and labeled with the maker's name, like Antonius Stradivarius, a man who made the finest violins of his time. I told him how there used to be violins so small that a dancing master could carry one in his pocket and take it out to play while he showed someone a new dance step. A violinist could do almost as many things with a violin as a singer with his voice. He could play notes that were very low and very high. He could make the music sad or soft, light, gentle, bright or strong. relived my childhood summers and felt again their timelessness when the whole future lay out there beyond the mist of a summer morning. I experienced a moment of great joy when we finally played a duet. We weren't man and boy then, or instructor and student. We were two musicians who had earned each other's respect.
overstayed my time. For me, writing a farewell note always seemed to make parting a little less sad, a little less difficult. In the distance, the sound of the boy's music reminded me of the really good moments our friendship had given us. I thought, when the boys grew older, they'd understand how difficult it is for an old man to part from his friends. standing, pondering over the writing. When he found me, he told me of the accident, the shattered violin back on the humpback bridge. I made a decision. I offered the boy my violin. It wasn't an easy decision. I could get another violin, not right away perhaps, not one like mine. But this wasn't what made the decision so difficult. A gift for music is only the beginning. There were hard years of discipline and practice ahead. I knew the boy was at a turning point, and I knew that he could turn his back on music forever. It was a strange feeling when I left my violin at the bottom of the wooden steps on a path in a country I might never see again. I picked up my other possessions, a load that had become heavier because of something I'd left behind. I wasn't sure whether his brief musical experience had been deep enough to survive the shock the loss of that wonderful first violin that he had learned to play. It would be kind of a betrayal of myself, and I would have felt oddly ashamed if my gesture were wasted, my violin abused or forgotten. Much as I loved the boy, both boys, I wasn't sure whether I was doing the right thing. remember other goodbyes in other places, the sounds of departure, a train whistle, 
smoked the lonely coffee and cigarette in an empty railway station. The knock of oars was my farewell song. I never would have glimpsed them again if it hadn't been for the boy's intuition, a happy idea that couldn't have been a more fitting end to that beautiful summer. Only one sound could have reached me through my melancholy that afternoon, the music of the violin. <laughs> 